Welcome to Blues' blog. I've uh, got Malistic on uh, hey. Skype. So, um, hey, Bruce, how are you? Good, mate. How are you doing? Very good, thanks. Yeah, I've, um, Mal, Mal's going to um, help us out. He's going to do the support for uh, J. Lewis Walker at the basement. So, what, what, um, Mal, I suppose let's start off with what, what got you into the Blues? I think, I mean, first of all, I think, you know, for all players with blues, there can be emotional things in your life, in, even in your young life. And once I got into hearing not just music, but the great lead guitar players, I guess it just hit the spot, and made me feel that it expressed even my own emotions as much or more than anything else. And I just got lured to the guitar, the sound, the feel of it, the emotion that comes across. Yeah. Mm. Oh, excellent. Yeah, I mean, um, it's, a, it's a great form of music. I, you know, some people kind of say, oh, you know, it's pretty simple and all that, but, you know, there's a lot of power in, um, you, know, you know. Yeah, that's that's a real fallacy, that one, I think, yeah. because, um, I mean, there is really simple blues, but the fact that the, the early, um, you know, creators of the blues guitar were using an old beat up instrument that was tuned to a chord means that there was a complexity about how harmonies work right there and there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, first of all, it's just the emotion, but I absolutely love blues guitar. And uh, one of my earliest favourites was uh, Eric Clapton. Um, my first ever LP was Led Zeppelin 1 when they were just an unheard of act in Australia. Yeah. And my second album was Fresh Cream. So, um, wow. Yeah. The, um, the band Free, Paul Kossoff from Free. So, through those guys, it led me to their influences, which was Freddie King, BB King, and Albert King. Yeah. Uh, the three kings sort of really opened up the world of, of the blues. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, totally agree. Um, you know, I've seen you support lots of um, great, great blues artists. I mean, blimey, geez, the list is kind of endless. You know, um, like Lonnie Mack and you know Buddy Guy and all sorts of people. You know, and mm. um, I don't know. Tell us a bit about all that. I mean, that oh god, that would be like you know a, a kid in a candy shop <laughs> you know, or something. You know, like wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I had the good fortune of doing a lot of international supports in my very first band. It's a band called Stars from Adelaide. Yeah. We had a, a record deal with Mushroom and got to support some great acts. But, you know, more straight rock acts such as the Beach Boys, Joe Cocker, Linda Ronstadt, etc. Um, when I started my own band to play blues, I had the good fortune of um, being picked to open show for Johnny Winter only about six months after I started my band. And... Uh, we did three shows with him in Sydney, yeah. and I guess, you know, as a roll-on happened, I ended up uh, with my band opening for Buddy Guy, um, Junior Wells, oh, yeah. Little Charlie and the Nightcats. Um, God, I remember um, Johnny yeah. Johnson too, I think, wasn't it? Johnny Johnson, Johnny Johnson yeah, oh, keyboard yeah. player for Chuck Berry. Gee, he was fantastic. Just one of those guys with a, a rare gift, totally unschooled player who just had the magic. It was absolute thrill to play with these kinds of guys. I, I found that, you know, as a an Australian guitar player, I I just noticed in their technique and the, in their emotion yeah. um, things that I was not familiar with hearing yeah. in uh, regular Australian gigs, and and that's the kind of guidance, I guess tuition that I picked up on, you know, with my own ear and wanted to know more about the blues. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I notice, I mean, I've seen you play, oh, blow me, wow, a lot of times and, um, you know, the the phrasing and stuff, you know, the, the, mm. you know obviously like a lot of a lot of hard work to, you know, work that out, you know, like come back yeah. to that thing and people think, oh, it's really easy. It's like, well, hang on a minute, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean... Certainly, I'm a slower player than probably average. Um, I've got short, stubby fingers. They're sort of not built for speed. But it's a great blues song. Built for comfort, ain't built for speed. Um, but the, those guitar players that I got into straight away, some of the melodies, the riffs, just fantastic. And through learning a, 
a killer guitar riff, which is one note at a time, and then to the, I guess, the simpler blues solos, and then as they get more complicated, um, it just really hit the spot for me. It mm -hmm. made me want to learn it, and then through reading interviews by from these these wonderful, you know, original blues players, they made the point it's not how many notes you play, it's the emotion, the expression that you bring to it. In fact, um, Clapton uh, made a great quote a long time ago. I read it in a guitar magazine. He just sort of said, you know, all you need is one note. Yeah. And, of course, you know, there are many players who go, well, you know, what kind of crap is that? Um, naturally, I didn't get it immediately, but naturally it means the right note. Right note, right time, right place. Yeah. And, um, you know, probably my my strongest influence as I was buying my first real deal electric guitar was Paul Kossoff from Free. Yeah, yeah. And his reputation was built around the fact that he played few notes, but they were the right ones. Yeah. So that's what I concentrate on. I'm not interested in trying to be the fastest player, but I try and find uh, the right notes and mood and expression yeah, and just think you know the, the great saying make the guitar talk well we don't all talk we you know it's it's um it's singling out the meaning of what you're saying and making it more clearly understood that's what i love about this guitar i remember reading this thing you know um like uh, i think it was bb king you know or steve Harry vaughan was playing you know in, at some gig, you know, and uh, B.B. King kind of arrived, you know, and he sat in with him and he's like going, oh, Jesus, you know, he's B.B. King, you know, and like he actually played mm. kind of rhythm guitar, I think, for him or something, And uh, but then it was time for B.B. to do a solo and he just kind of did one note and, you know, floored Steve Ray Vaughan, you know, like, wow. <laughs> That's um, it, yeah. man. Just that. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah. That, you know. You know, putting the real bite into it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I love, I love that. that. So you know, I've I think you can sort of look at it as an anti in an antithesis way too. I've seen a lot of fast guitar players, very fluent, mm. but I haven't picked up on much, much emotion out of it. And it's the emotion that matters the most to me. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. No. And I tell you, I've, I've yeah, watching you over the years, that's what I walk away with. You know. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's what I've always wanted. That. Yeah. The good news, and it's another quote from Clapton, actually, is um, you never know it all. Yeah. See, so, so by pl being what you might categorise as a simpler player, player uses less notes, it doesn't mean you know it all. I'd just like to make a point of that statement because it's very relevant to how we all learn. I got to meet Albert Collins. Oh, yeah. It was actually at... Um, we were in a hotel room together at Selena's, at Coogee Bay, yeah. which was his dressing room him. when he played there. Yeah. And I said to him, it was just him and me in the room, I was very privileged, and I just said, Albert, do you ever get nervous? And he said, son, the day you don't get nervous is the day you should give up. Yeah. And I've really, you know, believed in that ever since. It's, it's um, you know, when you think you've got the whole thing nailed, it's, you know, yeah. taking on a bit of a perfectionist kind of frame of mind um, with blues, it's about the expression. It's about possibly playing the same thing a little different uh, each night according to how your emotions are. Yeah. And uh, so what Albert really meant with the nerves is it's a healthy nerves. If, if you don't have any nerves, it must mean that you think you're good enough. Yeah. Well, the nerves are about bettering your better. Yeah, yeah. and it kind of... Um shows you you care you know like it's i think so yeah definitely oh yeah yeah no i'm hearing you of that that's a it's great right. really really yeah. great philosophy man. <laughs> well, so, so, so. so um you know what can we expect you know you're you're supporting joe you know um uh, what can we expect for from you when you when you do it you know you're going to be in yeah. instrumental mode you know i think right it's going to be a different thing for me i've always loved instrumentals and by the way it's another you know, reason why I love the Three Kings. You know, Freddie King, the first album I ever got of Freddie King was called Bonanza of Instrumentals. It was like 24 blues guitar instrumentals. Yeah. 
and um, Stevie Ray Vaughan, of course, beautiful instrumentals. Oh, Lenny. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> Lenny. Which, which, the first time I heard that, I, I really wanted to learn it and be able to play it and still love it to this day just as much as when I first heard it. I mean, speaking of Stevie Ray, a bit Riviera Paradise, oh, what a masterpiece. Yeah. So, um, and, and also when I was young, I bought some Shadows albums. Mm. I can remember being on tour with Jimmy Barnes, actually, in 1985, yeah. and uh, it's true, it was a pretty loud band. <laughs> um, I remember going back to my hotel room when we were on the road uh, at night, very quietly, and learning shadow songs. How <laughs> about that from Cheese to Chalk? Yeah. Um, I also learned Lenny when it first came out when I was with Jimmy Barnes. So the, the I guess the counter action of crystal clean, be- beautiful guitar sound with expression, nice reverb, everything, is a thing that I do. And I've been doing instrumentals really ever since in my own band. I look on it as uh, one of the reasons why I started my own band was to be able to play blues and also to be able to play instrumentals. So I do probably up to 20 instrumentals and in my own shows I always do a handful of them. Um, On my two albums I've got a total of seven instrumentals amongst the vocal ones. So to be able to open for Joe Lewis Walker um, I just thought that it would be a uh, wonderful opportunity for me to play an instrumental set in front of a great blues audience and uh, also to, you know, hopefully add some nice flavour to the Joe Lewis Walker show. Oh, cool. Yeah, and I'm so looking forward to it, mate, I'll tell you. Um, and I can imagine, yeah, people are going to walk away from that one going, wow, that's, uh, you know, a special night, you know. For yeah, absolutely. You know, I, mean, I think I'd just like to add that one of the most magic times in my musical career was opening for Buddy Guy. It was in early 92 and um, he was on the the same gig with Stevie Ray Vaughan the night that he died in the helicopter crash. And um, at sound checks, his band told us very clearly, do not mention the the name Stevie Ray Vaughan because Buddy's still really cut. I was playing Lenny and... In the last gig, so I was actually playing with Chain. It was Chain who was opening for Buddy Guy. Yeah. And I was doing Lenny, Steve and I called Lenny in the show. And although I don't think it ethical, I sort of plucked up the courage to ask Matt Taylor if he would mind if I played Lenny real late in the set on our last show because I'd noticed Buddy Guy was coming in about two thirds of the way through our set. Yeah. So his band, his other guitar, but they said you cannot mention Stevie Ray Vaughan's name. So it was a bit of courage, but I did play Lenny that night and um, so I'm getting shivers down my back now. And after the show, yeah. Buddy's tour man just come in and said, Buddy, God, I'd like to have lunch with you tomorrow. Well, that just got me. <laughs> really? Yeah, wow. I get shivers. And just according to the stuff that I'd heard, mm. Buddy never mentioned Stevie Ray's name. He was talking, you know, I can only try with it. I'm talking about the mud. Yeah, yeah. It was one of the most thrilling experiences in my life. Wow. And and that, without words spoken, led from playing Stevie Ray Vaughan's Lenny. Yeah. That's how deep I find some of these pieces to play. Yeah. You know, a similar one, I guess, on my own last album is an instrumental called Swept Away. Wow. Very emotional, slow piece, um, which I'll be featuring in the show with Joe Lewis Yeah, uh, I love that song. That's a great song. Mm. Uh, I remember... Um, a while ago, um, when you were on this um, uh, bill of guitar, I think it was called Blues and Beyond or something, and it was at the basement, you know, and there was, mm. you know, a lot of other, you know, great guitar players. Kevin, you know, Kevin Borridge was there. Yeah. And, um, you know, Phil Manning was there and, you know, a whole lot of other people. And um, you came out and played, um, I think it was Two Loves. I think it was either that or Busy yes. Blues. It was a yes. slow blues song. And I tell you, I, and I have... There's a few people in the audience like Rex Go and a couple of those guys and, you know, I worked with them and everyone was just, you know, it was really good. And thing that I remember most, apart from obviously the, the music, was Kevin and everyone was, when you came off stage, they all went, you know, like, we're not worthy, you know, like, because you just, 
you knocked it out. I'll tell you, it seriously did. Um, it was... I get nervous at gigs. I probably didn't notice. Cause... Oh, mate, you could hear a pin drop. Apart from you know, you know, you're playing and stuff. The whole place was as soon as you, you that first note. It was like that first note. You know what what we were kind of saying yeah. before, and it just yeah. bang. You know, it was, it's actually just reminded me of another one of my most thrilling times too. And that was um, I did a gig, a private gig on a rural property where um, Kevin Byrich Express was on, Andy and Moss, um, myself, and uh, it was 2004, the, which was the year that the Eagles toured, and Kevin had played with Joe Walsh in the Party Boys in the mid-80s, oh, yeah. and he was, he was able to connect with Joe, and he played on this gig, and then uh, after their set, they asked whether I'd like to get up and have a blow. With Joe Walsh, and I was the first guy in Australia to use a talk box playing Rocky Mountain Way. So huh. that was a very, very special to meet Joe Walsh and play with him. Oh, blimey, mate. Yeah. Mm. Let's, um, so I'm going to cover this more of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mate, yeah, I know you've like, I remember another memorable, memorable moment for me was um, with Lonnie Mack, and you did yeah. the support of that. And, um, and it was actually, he came out a few times, I think, um, but. There was a time where it was actually just after Stevie Ray's, you know, um, death and all that sort of stuff. And, um, yes. and he said, um, you know, I'm not going to do a tribute now. I'm going to do it at the end, you know, of my tour here in Australia. So, you know, consequently, I went and saw every concert, you know, you were there. And, um, yeah. and it was amazing. It was something else again, yeah. you know. Um, what a player he was. Too. Yeah, that they did that album together. Stevie Ray producing oh. Lonnie Mac's album, Strike yeah. Like Lightning. Yeah. That was when I first met Lonnie. That album was released in 85, and Lonnie toured here the first time in 86, yeah. January 86, and that was actually the very first Mallee Stick Band gig was opening for Lonnie Mack at the basement. Yeah. He sold out, and it ended up being eight sold-out shows. Yeah, that was and, um, awesome. You know? I'll just tell you one of my most embarrassing moments. Oh, excellent. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, was, I was absolutely honoured, but nervous as hell when... Uh, it was before Lonnie Mack went on for Encore on his last show. He just said, I'd like to get Mal Eastig up to play yeah. with us. And honestly, I pooed my pants. Um, <laughs> had to get up there. I remember I, I tuned up my guitar. I was kind of dawdling. Go, woo, what are we going to do? Okay, Lonnie. And he, Lonnie looked at me and said, you pick. That made me nervous. And I went, oh, I'm ready. You know, Willie Dixon's song, I'm Ready, yeah. it was Freddie King's version. He went, okay, yeah. you start. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that made me that nervous, but I counted it in too fast. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, but these are the ways that you learn and that you learn the blues, and I was just so privileged to have that experience, and I've made sure ever since that I never started jam like that too fast again. <laughs> I think when um yeah when you did the the Lonnie Mac supports it was kind of probably one of the first times I actually saw you live, you know I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd heard yeah. you know heard you on record and stuff like that, but you know and I was like just going wow who's this buddy who's this Aussie you know <laughs> supporting well, it does that up actually and it was because, this, you know, and as I said it was my very first Malistic band gig so I just created the band yeah and got offered that so they were our first gigs of my. Um, Career under my own name. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And that was with um, Shauna singing too, wasn't it? I think. Yeah, yeah Shauna Jensen. Yeah, yeah. And um, the rhythm section that I don't think were well known players at the time, mm. but uh, certainly with with Shauna, we'd worked together playing for Jimmy Barnes. Uh, Shauna was in the backing vocal section and on the album. And that's how we met. And um, when I decided to to go on my own and play more blues, and she was a killer soul singer you know yeah. she could sing like Aretha Franklin so well so it became a great combination and as we said the launch of it was opening for Lonnie Mac. Yeah right yeah mm -hmm. yeah. I, um, yeah I really enjoyed I mean I've enjoyed every sing you've had you know I, it, it was yeah Shauna was the first one I heard you know because she was the first singer and it was great yeah you know? yeah really really good no. so, so um guitars maybe just a quick little bit there because I suppose some people would understand if we went into guitar land a bit, but you know, I want to because yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love guitar and stuff. So, um, you know, 
what would be your favourite guitar? You know, your favourite guitar. You know. Yeah. Now, well, can I just say, do you mean brand or type, or do you uh, mean regardless of that, an, an individual guitar? And uh, probably an individual guitar first, but a brand, yeah, brand and individual. Yeah. Group, yeah. Well, my favourites are Fender Strats. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't mean the more modern design ones. I just love the old original Fender Strats. My first uh, serious guitar was a Gibson Les Paul Custom because that was what um, Paul Kossoff used and I was yeah. just writing with Paul Kossoff at the time. Um, it's just worth <laughs> noting, I think, that uh, it's more technical, but I found Les Paul very difficult to play because of my hands and stubby fingers and I think for a young guy, when you're on a guitar and you're having trouble with it, you actually start to question whether you're built for playing guitar. Uh, I then switched to a Strat a few years later, which was probably a little harder to play in a way because they've got a different string tension. But once I grew into them, I absolutely loved it and um, been using them ever since. Now, the, the closest one, my absolute favourite, uh, belonged to my dear friend, the late Andrew Durant. We were in uh, our first band, Stars, together. And Andy and I were close buddies. We used to room together mm. and write songs together. Unfortunately, he got melanoma and passed away when we were 25. But the, his favourite Stratocaster, um, you know, I did a benefit concert for him, which I think is reasonably well known, but his family left me his black Stratocaster. And that is still my most treasured instrument to this day. And I've actually done quite a few records on it, like um, Jimmy Barnes' debut album, I played on that. No Second Prize was his first number one hit. Yeah. That's Andy's guitar. Yeah, right. And uh, okay. killer tracks on my albums are also Andy's guitar. Yeah, because um, you did a fair bit of playing with um, Jimmy Barnes, didn't you? You like, you know, I remember seeing you at the um, Entertainment Centre. Um, yes. In the, the Barnstorming tour i think it was yeah it's just like no, wow it was, no it was before that actually yeah, yeah, it was okay. uh, yeah uh jimmy started his band you know it's basically straight out of culture mm -hmm. and went on the road the start of 1984 and you know i literally remember the first gig we did was um at i think townsville university yeah. um he was nervous you know taking a chance on um how many people might come or how good we were going to be. Well, 12 months later, we did the Sydney Entertainment Centre, sold out, and it was filmed and um, came out actually about nine months later. I think it was on Channel 9. They played it on New Year's Eve, New Year's Eve uh, going into 1985, and that was a hell of an honour. Yeah. I just got out. I was playing Andy's guitar on that concert too. Yeah, right, yeah. And then, so you, mm. you, you went and recorded... Um in the States with him too, didn't you, or something, I think? Yes, I did. Yeah. Um, the, the album I was just talking about was the Body Swerve album, his first album, and No Second Prize was the big hit on it. I did the uh, lead guitar on that, um, which I think has been well talked about. But um, in 1985, Jim got a deal with uh, Geffen Records in the United States mm -hmm. and went over to do some songwriting with some leading um writers in America who were known to have some previous number one hits and um, he asked me from over there, I just got a phone call at four in the morning and I said, Mal, get on a plane, I want you to come to America and I'd never been overseas in my life, <laughs> but wow, you know, I just couldn't wait and um, that led to sessions for his hit single, I'd Die to Be With You Tonight, which was a song written by a great writer in Hollywood who'd written... Uh, a couple of number one hits, uh, Ain't Missing You At All by John Waite and um, um, another one by Stevie Nicks. So for me to be able to play on that session was an absolute honour. Uh, you know, I was incredibly nervous, but remember that nervous is, pays off if you're with the right people. Yeah. And um, another guitar player on that track was Waddy Wachtel. Oh, yeah. And with... Um, was he red hair and glasses? Who I first met him when Stars supported Linda Ronstadt. He came out with them, and he also played with James Taylor yeah, in yeah. the seventies. Yeah. Um, but when 
Jim and Geffen Records got him to come in for that session. He'd just done a tour with Keith Richards. I'm pretty sure he was in, if I'm right, the expensive winos. Oh, yeah, <laughs> the right. bands. Yeah. And we got on really good, you know, we um, just talked about even Keith's guitars, how some of these guys set up their guitars and great guitar sounds and it was one of the thrills of my life. Yeah, yeah. I remember um, the, like you having an, it was swimming in a pool or something rather and you met Bonnie Rape just before she was about to just go whammo, you know, kind of thing. That yeah, was that, really, that was actually on the same trip. I should yeah. add that the bass player on that song was Kenny Gradney from Little Feet. And, you know, I was wow. a huge Little Feet fan at the time. So it was actually with Kenny. Um, we went to his one of his relatives' houses on Independence Day. Yeah. It was a different experience. Everyone had a little American flag badge on their front doors and we'd knock on the doors. God save America. Okay. <laughs> and um, it was through that party that, that Kenny Gradney sort of took us to where we met a lot of his family who were more Cajun from New Orleans. Yeah. Um, you know, picking up on music from that. Uh, so with these influences that I did meet with Jimmy in America that time, that also probably gave me the drive and the inspiration to start my own band. Yeah. Take the plunge. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no. yeah no, I, I remember reading a quite old um, Barnsley when we, we interviewed him, you know, a little while ago, and he, he said, um, basically said, you were the best blues guitarist in Australia. He was... High accolades, and I think he's he actually too. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you know, that very and, much. Yeah, and he took it a bit further. It was pretty funny actually, because he he started talking about how um, uh, I think it was during Stars he was like a roadie or he'd sort of hang around, and um and drink your rider, <laughs> something like that. It was pretty like funny. Him, um, <laughs> no, it was actually was special days. Yeah. It it actually goes right back to the beginning, the way um. The first band that I was able to put together that was aiming to do gigs, our very first gigs in our life, yes. we couldn't find a singer. And we were rehearsing for quite some time, learning songs and sort of counting the bars of when it's going to change to a chorus because we didn't have a singer to go by. Yeah. And then I got a tip that there was this, uh, this guy. I mean, we were about 18. Uh, there was a guy from the other side of town in Adelaide and sort of chased him and tried to get a phone number and someone said, oh, sorry, man, he's just got a gig. He's joined a band called Orange. Well, it wasn't that long later. Orange changed its name to Cold Chisel. Yeah. So <laughs> we wow. met back in those days and great with Ian Moss too. When I was in Stars, us and Chisel, we used to cross paths on the road a lot. Yeah. And um, Jim did have some kind of... Um, time out of cold chisel. I've got no idea why. It's not the politics that I know anything about. But he then sang with Fraternity for a little while, a great band from Adelaide, and the, the original singer of Fraternity was Bon Scott. Yeah. And he left Fraternity to join ACDC. Yeah, right. So, yeah. 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 So Swanee actually played drums with, um, with Fraternity as well, um, and Jimmy was in it for some months. We, we kind of reconnected a bit more then and in that sort of lull period um, between him and Chisel, yes, he, he went out on the road with us and we, we were touring out of Adelaide to Sydney and Melbourne and he came along and um, helped us with the gear and we got to know each other a lot better. Yeah. You know, I know you, um, we won't go right into it, but, you know, you had a bit of a time off because you, you know, had, had an operation and a bit of that um, and... Yeah. Uh, you know, how, how do you feel nowadays? You know, like, you, I mean, last time I saw you play, you're playing better than you ever have, you know? It's like, it's well, great. Well, very much for that. Um, no, it was a situation where, um, well, I guess I can say I'm lucky to be alive. Mm. I look at it as I'm in my second life due to the gratitude of modern medicine. Yeah. And um, one of the first things that I... I guess pushed myself to try after I'd been ill was playing the guitar again. And it was actually the song Lenny. I'm, I'm not trying to be boastful or over-exaggerate here. It's, um, my guitar was brought to my hospital bed and I was 
terrified, nervous as to whether I'd be able to do it again. And I picked it up and Lenny came out of me. So I knew from there I'll, I'll, I'll try and get better in as many ways as I can, but the guitar's got to stay. And um, yeah. it def definitely ever since, I think I can be quite honest and say, that's my trade and I'll leave other trades to other people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, you know, um, yeah, like I said before, yeah, when I saw you last time play, you, you know, you're playing better than ever, mate. You know, it's... Yeah, I know it sounds probably a bit strange, but through... Through the um, you know absolute difficulty and emotions and everything of you know being seriously ill and coming back from it has given me the blues in a very genuine way. I don't play blues now just because I learn blues songs; it's because I've lived it. Yeah. Um, a lot of players who play blues may say they do or not, but. But perhaps may not. I'm not. I'm not trying to put this across in the wrong way. It's just that I went through an experience of realizing how important the guitar was to me. The expression of playing the guitar. Um, it's priceless, and I'm very grateful that I've been able to do it ever since. And um, I want to keep learning until the day I go. Yeah. Oh, mate. So, well, I will. I will. We'll leave it there. That's. I mean, I tell you. We could talk for ages, and we're going to talk again <laughs> for sure. Because you've you've got so many uh, stories, and you know it's just really nice to hear you hear you talk about stuff. You know, I, I'm uh, yeah. No. Well, it's it's mutual, Bruce, because I've always known since I met you your interest in the blues and in great music too. And it's I'm I'm rapt to see you, um, you know, literally bringing acts to this country, and it's a pleasure to work with you and to open up for. Joe Going to have a, a lot more work for you, mate. <laughs> I certainly hope so. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Thanks. Well, take care and... Um, you too. See, yeah, see you soon. <laughs> I'm doing these blogs because I love blues music and I know you guys do too. So let's share it. Share it to all your friends and show them the power of blues music.